Greetings, everyone, and welcome to church today. I'm Pastor Corey Conran here at the Cooper's United Methodist Church, and it is such a privilege to gather with you today to worship our God. Welcome. As we prepare to worship, grab your Bible. It's always good to have it and to ready and to read with us together. Our scripture verses today come from two books in the Old Testament, from Genesis chapter 16 and Psalm 121. So go ahead and turn there so that you're ready when we read here in a few minutes. And you can easily find them in your index in the front of your Bible if you don't know exactly where those books are at. And whether you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube today, take a second in the comments below and let's welcome one another. And also make sure to like and subscribe to our pages there. The more, who we, the more people we have who follow us on social media, the better we can get the message of God out to others uh, it's really cool how the algorithms work. The more people that you have following um, on those on those platforms, so do that today. Also, check out our digital bulletin at CoopersvilleUMC.updates.church. On there, you're going to find our order of worship, our connection card, our prayer cards. You'll also find links for our online giving, our website, our upcoming events as well. As we begin to uh, our time today, we're going to start with a call to worship from Psalm 98, and then a prayer. And when our worship music starts, let's join our voices together and sing our praises to God today. Holy God, in reverent awe, we come to worship you. We gather to honor and glorify God's mighty name. Righteous God, we rejoice as we come to worship you. We gather to celebrate God's power over the forces of evil. Faithful God, with thankfulness, we come to worship you. We gather to sing praises to the God in whom we trust. Amen. Dear Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. You save us and sustain us. Help us to trust in you and to worship whether we have a lot or a little today. May our praise bring you glory and remind us of your promises. We love you, Lord. We seek your presence and we worship you alone. Bless us as we seek to bless your holy name this day. Amen.
fantastical wave I will not flee since God through Jordan leadeth me Hi, my name is Stan Bertog, and I invite you to open your Bibles today as we read our scripture passages. We will be reading from Genesis 16, verses 7 to 13, and Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I am reading from the New Living Translation. Genesis 16. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to shore. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will rise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord, who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also says, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? Psalm 121 A Psalm for Pilgrims Ascending to Jerusalem I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Who is God? That's the question that we started this series with. Who is this God we claim to believe in, to, to follow? Who is this God we proclaim as our Savior? You know, I found that when I ask church folk that question, uh, many of us struggle to put words to it. We know who God is. We believe in God. But we have a hard time articulating it, right? But the problem is people outside the church, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, they're asking that question. And they're finding that Christians really can't help them. So they turn to friends and Google and the media. And for the most part, they aren't finding the hope that we know in God. Folks, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, church, we need to know how to answer that question when people ask us. Because they're asking, they're searching, and we have the answers. That's what we've been learning these past six weeks learning who God is. And we've discovered some absolutely phenomenal things about this God of ours. And along the way, too, we've learned language for answering that question. Who is God? Our God is merciful, not giving us what we deserve, but pouring out his grace and love on all of us. He is trustworthy, keeping his promises and never failing to come through so we don't have to worry. He loves us with a personal, passionate, and intimate love of our Heavenly Father. He is a holy God, a God of justice who will not tolerate evil existing and destroying his beloved creation. And he offers restoration and reconciliation for all of our sins. He is immutable. He is the God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will never change. All that we know of God is who God will always be. And in that, we can find great confidence when life gets frustrating and overwhelming. This is who our God is. Merciful, trustworthy, our loving Father, holy, immutable, and unchanging. So who is our God? He's God. 
And in that, there is immeasurable hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, pour yourself out upon your people today as we worship you, as we seek your face and we try to learn and understand just who you are. Give us answers to feed our minds and hope to nourish our souls. And give us courage to seek understanding so that we can provide answers and hope when the world asks, who is God? And we can say, he is God. Amen. You know, this has been one of my favorite sermon message series in a long time. I have learned so much about these attributes of God, and I hope you have too. If you've missed any of these messages and you want to revisit them, uh, please check out our YouTube channel or our website. They are easily accessible there. You know, we humans, we spend a lot of time worrying about ourselves and our little spheres of life. Even as the church, we get really bogged down by what all of this means to us and, and how it can benefit me. You know, spending time discovering who God is has given me, and hopefully all of us, a needed reality check. He is God, and we are not. We are not the center of the universe. Now, we're important to be sure. I mean, God loves us. You right there, you matter to God. Everything about your life matters to God, and there's nothing... Um, there's never anything that you could do that would make God love you any more or any less. And yet, our God is the God of all creation, high and lifted up, holy and completely other than us. In learning to articulate who God is, we need to remember that God is not like us, but he loves us and he calls us to be holy like he is holy. This is what we've learned these past six weeks. And today, as we finish this series, I have one more question for us to ponder in the whole who is God discussion. You know, we've talked about that main question, who is God? We've talked about the why, because people want to know. But now I have a what question. What does it all matter? What does it mean to say this is who God is? To, to believe, really believe, like to build my life around the reality that this is who God is. You know, that's the other question people are asking. You know, this might be who God is, but so what? We're finishing this series today with a message entitled, Hope for a Hopeless Situation. Why does it matter that our God is merciful and trustworthy and a loving Father and holy and unchanging? Because that is the only God who will be there for us when we're in some of the worst situations of our lives and everything and everyone else has failed us. Do you sometimes feel all alone? You know, like no one sees you, like no one cares? Like somehow this life really doesn't matter? Uh, like y maybe you sometimes believe that your heartache won't ever heal and that the pain is so great that you even doubt that God cares about your real problems. And if, you know, if that's not you, it's a good bet you know someone who's been through that, who is or will be through that at some point. This is why it matters who God is. We're going to be looking at a name of God today, a name of God that was given to us by a servant woman. And this name tells us something about God, about how God relates to us, his people. Now, this story comes from the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 16. And it's the story of a woman named Hagar. Hagar is a servant of Sarah and Abraham. She's from Egypt, and she's a slave. Now, God had promised Abraham and Sarah that he was going to bless them with children. So many children, in fact, that he would make them into a great nation, and all of the other nations on earth would be blessed through Abraham. So God has this plan for them. All right, that's in Genesis chapter 12. We read about that. Now, fast forward to Genesis 16. This is 10 years later. And they still don't have a single child. Ten years of waiting. I mean, they're old at this point, right? I mean, like, Abraham is 86. His wife is in her early 70s. They'd waited ten years so far, and God has not come through for them. They were getting anxious, impatient. So instead of waiting any longer, they did what a lot of us do. And they took matters into their own hands. You know, they tried to help God along. We do that, don't we? I mean, we, we think that... We need to help God on his plans. Maybe maybe God hasn't come through because he's waiting for us 
to do something. You know, that's, that's what Sarah thought. So she came up with her own plan. Hey, Abraham, I think you need to take Hagar, my servant, as your wife. She can be like a surrogate mother to bear children for us. Now, that was actually a pretty common practice in the culture. And it wouldn't have been that crazy a thing other than the whole, you know, accomplishing God's work without him peace. So they went ahead with her plan. And the plan worked. Hagar got pregnant. Abraham was ecstatic. He was finally getting a child. But the pain and the hurt and the shame that Sarah had didn't go away. You know, she couldn't give her husband a child. But this, this servant girl did. And quickly, too. So she took her pain out on Hagar one day. Somehow, she mistreated Hagar so harshly that Hagar ran away. She took off out into the desert, to the wilderness. That's where we find her in our passage here in Genesis 16. We, we find her there in a hopeless situation, alone, pregnant in the wilderness, afraid, not knowing what to do or what would happen next. In verse 7, something incredible happens. The angel of the Lord found her in a, uh, along, or beside a spring of water in the wilderness. And he said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? I'm fleeing my mistress, Sarai, she replied. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit to her. That sounds, that sounds kind of wild, doesn't it? I mean, but listen to what he tells her next. He says, I will give you more descendants than you can count. You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. Her son's name would be a testimony that God hears our situations and our cries. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? And here's the key verse for today. This is in verse 13. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. In Hebrew, it's you are El Roy. Have I truly seen the one who sees me, she asks. God is Elroy. He is the God who sees, who God sees us. He knows us. He's with us even in the darkest, most lonely situation, most hopeless situation. God sees. And he didn't just see Hagar, right? I mean, he knew everything about her, her situation, her emotions, her fear, all of it. God sees you too. All of it, all of who you are, all of everything you're going through. God is Elroy. Now, what does that do to us, right? What does knowing that God sees it all, that God sees all of us, what does that do to us? Well, for some of us, it causes concern, right? He knows everything about me. Yeah, even that thing that I'm afraid of anyone else finding out about. God sees that too. He sees my sins and my thoughts. God sees them and he knows them. Anybody else just a little bit concerned by this? Hebrews 4.13 tells us nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. We need to know this, folks. We need to know that there is nothing we can hide from God. Because knowing this causes us to be concerned. It causes us to, to consider our ways. And that concern, it can lead us to conviction. Being convicted of our sins, that feeling of guilt and even shame about the wrong things we do, that's actually a good thing. It's a God thing because it causes us to pause and to hopefully reconsider our actions. It, it makes us think, I don't want to keep living like this. I, I don't want to feel like this, so I need to change what I'm doing. And that concern leads us to feeling sorry for our actions and hopefully to turning to God for forgiveness. See, our God sees us, all of us, and that is a cause for concern. But it also causes something us sometimes to be confused, maybe even a little bewildered. Like, God, if you see everything, I don't understand. I'm confused. I mean, you know about all of it. Everything is happening. So why? 
you know, there's all this pain and suffering. You know, all over 24,000 people lost their lives in a natural disaster this week in Turkey and Syria. Why don't you do something about it, God? I mean, if you love us, your creation so much, and you see all that's happening, why aren't you doing something? You know, this is one of the hardest questions we're faced with when it comes to an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God. It's confusing why God doesn't do something to fix it all. But this is where we need some perspective. See, we see things in this life with blurred vision. We only have a partial view of things. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. So what causes this blurred vision? Well, this is where we, become, we need some, some biblical foundational knowledge. We live in a, in a fallen world, one where sin has brought pain and suffering. And ever since the very beginning with Adam and Eve, we've lived under the curse of sin. And there's pain, immeasurable pain involved with that. Sin is destructive and, and there's brokenness and suffering because of it. We also have a spiritual enemy who is running loose, the, the devil who's after us to steal, kill, and destroy, as Jesus said. Yet in all of this, God tells us through the Bible, throughout the whole Bible, God tells us that he is good. That he has a plan for redemption, for fixing all that has been destroyed because of sin. So we have a God who, who loves to restore and redeem and rescue. Yet even in the midst of that great amount of biblical knowledge, there are still going to be things we don't understand. That, that we'll never understand this side of heaven. In fact, scripture tells us in Isaiah 55, 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We just have a partial view. We can't see everything. You know, it's like these glasses. Lots of us wear them. Why? Well, because without them, we have blurred vision. Without these glasses, I can barely make out my hand in front of me, let alone trying to read anything with any sort of clarity. You know, I can see shapes and outlines, but details, descriptions, the minute details, nah. I need help seeing clearly. But when I put my glasses back on, man, things really do start clearing up. I can make sense of things, or at least I can start seeing things better. We see things now imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. We don't understand all of the insanity in our world. There's, there's a lot going on and the whole creation is crying out. We ask, why God? Don't you see? And he replies, yes, I see. I have a plan. I'm working all things out for the good of those who love me and whom I call. Trust me, God says. One day you will see what I am doing. One day all things will be made right. Right now, we don't, we don't know what we don't know, and we can only see what we can see, which isn't everything. So there's going to be some confusion, because we only have partial vision. But we have to be careful that that partial vision uh, and, and the fear and the pain in our lives and in our world, that they don't cause us to doubt God's goodness. Let's look back at Hagar for a minute. You know, she did the same thing. She had this revelation of God, one like most of us have never experienced. She encountered the God who sees, and yet five chapters later, the, the son that God promised Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, has finally come on the scene. And now there's no room for Hagar and Ishmael in that happy little family. So Abraham sends them packing. This time, they do some... They, they do have some provisions. God actually even tells Abraham to send them away. It's going to be okay. I'll take care of them. But, but as she goes off, she's in the desert and their provisions run off. And Hagar and her son are crying their eyes out, thinking they're about to die of thirst in this desert. She had forgotten. Hagar had forgotten the God who sees her, who takes care of her. Who, and so she's crying. And what happens next is so beautiful. The Lord, a voice from heaven says, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him, comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. 
And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well full of water. It was there the whole time. She just couldn't see it. Pastor Tony Evans has a great quote about this situation with Hagar. He said, the well that Hagar saw, it was there all the time. But she was so busy crying, so busy forgetting God. She stopped trusting and stopped looking for God. See, she had seen the one who saw her, but then she forgot. How often do we just forget to look to God? We forget that he's there, that he's right here with us. We get so confused. Our pain and our fear cause us to start forgetting and doubting. Hagar did that too. She, she needed to know God more deeply in that moment. And we all need to know God more deeply. We need to keep learning more and more about God, growing closer and closer to him so that we won't forget who he is in those painfully or deeply painful points in life. We'll be able to remember better, to know the God who sees, the, and to cling to that no matter how dark and how painful life gets. Don't let your confusion over the things of this life ever let you forget that God is here and that God sees you and loves you and is working even now. Take hope and confidence in that reality. Now, we've said that knowing God, the, that God sees everything, does some things to us. It, it causes us to be concerned. That's the whole conviction of sin thing. And it causes us to be confused because we don't see or understand everything that's going on. But knowing that our God sees everything can also be a cause for comfort. When the Lord spoke to Hagar in that moment of pain and doubt, she had to have felt such comfort in knowing that God was there that God saw her and, and her beloved child. In the presence of God, there is peace, there is comfort, there is fullness of joy. You see, can, can you just imagine what it must have been like for Hagar? Right, She went from being just an Egyptian slave that was used for her womb and thrown away when she was no longer needed to realizing that she was beloved by God, that God saw her and knew her. He called her by her name. She realized in that moment that God was not distant. He's not unknowable. He's personal. He's caring. He pays attention. She names God El Roy. In a sense, she's proclaiming to all of us, even today, friends, that God is not far away. He is not asleep. He knows you. He's intimately involved in your life. He knows what you've been through, what you're going through right now. He cares. He doesn't miss a thing. He's the true God who sees. Amen. God gave Hagar such comfort. He gave her a future hope so she could go back into a difficult situation and endure. Because she knew God was with her, that he cared. Have you ever sat there thinking, God, are you there? Do you even see what's going on? Do you even care? I remember thinking those exact words when I found out that I was pregnant at 17. God, are you there? Why is this happening? This can't be happening. Don't you care about me, about my future? Well, thankfully, yes, God saw, God cared. God knew so much more than I did. And today I have a beautiful, amazing daughter because of it. I actually have four amazing kids and a wonderful granddaughter. Because God saw this things a whole lot clearer than I did. Praise the Lord. Friends, I want you to know that today, even right now, God sees you. You matter to God. You are dearly loved. You have immense value. Jesus said as much in Matthew 6, 26. He said, look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? God sees you. He sees your worries. He sees your fears, your insecurities. And he is seeking you out. He wants to replace pain with peace. He seeks to be known. Or he seeks to be known and he knows you. But he also wants to be known by you. So how do we respond to a God like this? A God who sees, who loves, who knows us. How, how do we respond to that? Seek to know God who sees you. We must seek to know him, folks. Not just know about God, 
but we truly have to know him. We've got to put our phones down and turn off the televisions. We have to seek to know our Savior. Right? It's no wonder that we're drowning in doubt and fear and unbelief because we're not seeking God. Hagar saw the God who saw her. We need to do the same. When you seek God earnestly, he promises that we will find him. When you see him, and maybe not physically like you can see me, but when you see him spiritually, you will see love. You will see mercy and peace. You will see holiness that will transform you. You'll see hope. You'll see the way maker. You'll see joy and truth and freedom. This is what the psalmist is proclaiming in Psalm 121. He says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So we're not going to get so focused on our problems that we get blinded to the truth. We need to see the truth. God is good. God sees you. He cares. So lift your eyes up to him. Look to him every single day throughout the whole day. He is our helper, our hope. And then... When you see that God, when you see the God who sees you, help others to see him as well. See, this isn't something we keep to ourselves. It's not like the box of cards that I have in my office that I've received from friends and loved ones that I, I pull out when I need some encouragement and reminder that I'm loved, but I don't share with anyone else. This is something I'm going to broadcast to everyone because I want others to know that God sees them, that God loves them, that God is not far off, that God is right with them, right in the pain. He's not forgotten them. He's working. They just can't see it. I want others to know that there is hope for their hopeless situation because our God is El Roy. He is the God who sees. Amen. Pray with me. You are God. That's it. It's that simple. You, Lord, you, you, Father, you are great God. You are merciful and trustworthy and loving and holy and unchanging. You are the God who sees us, who knows us, and who loves us no matter what. You are El Roy. Thank you. Thank you, God, that you have never abandoned us, that you've never left us, that you will not leave us alone in our pain and misery. Thank you that you are right here calling us, loving us, and seeking after us. Sometimes, God, that's a scary thing. To be fully known means that we have no secrets. You know it all. You know all our sins, all our shame, all our schemes. Sometimes that makes us ashamed and scared, and so we avoid you. We try to hide from you like Adam and Eve did in the garden after they sinned. But you are El Roy. The God who sees. There is nothing hidden from you. And you still love us. Lord, convict us of our sins. Bring to light all those things we would prefer to stay in the shadows. Give us the strength to seek your forgiveness and love and to truly turn from our wicked ways. Lord, don't let any sin hide in us anymore. We don't want it anymore. Redeem us and restore us, Lord. And God, in those times when we're confused by this, the pain and the suffering all around us, help us to turn to you. Lord, we cry out on behalf of the people of Turkey and Syria today, whose whole world was destroyed in a matter of minutes this week. We pray for those who still may be alive under the rubble and debris from that devastating earthquake. We pray for the rescue workers and for those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those communities that have been destroyed and who are trying to make sense of a senseless situation. Lord, turn the hearts of your people to respond in grace and generosity, in prayer and petition. Lord, help these people, even when we cannot. And God, help us to help those around us who are confused and scared, who don't understand what's going on in our world, who question how you could be a good God with all this pain and suffering. Help us to show them who you are, to point them to the God who sees, who cares, who is working all things out for redemption. Give us comfort, Lord, when life gets bad, and help us comfort others in those times as well. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you and we praise your holy name. 
hear us now as we pray together that prayer you taught us, the Lord's Prayer, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's now declare our shared beliefs as Christ followers as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're at the point in our service where we set aside time to receive an offering, where we give money as an act of worship to support the ministry and the work of God through this church. As we do, I want to share another story about God seeing someone. This story comes from the Gospel of Mark, and in it we find Jesus, remember God in the flesh, sitting down across from the place at the temple where the offerings were put. And he was watching people put the, their money in the box. Many rich folk came and put uh, large amounts of money in. But then Jesus sees a poor widow come in and she put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Well, Jesus calls his disciples to him and he says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more money, more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. We're told that Jesus saw all that was going on that day at the temple offering box. He saw the big deal some of the rich folk made about their giving. But he also saw the sacrifice of this poor widow. He truly saw her actions. But he also saw her heart behind it. He saw that this woman wanted to worship God with all that she had. And for Jesus, that meant far more than all the gold all those rich folk put in the coffers. See, God sees not only what we do, but the heart behind it as well. So when we give of all we have to worship God, we don't care so much about the amount, but the heart. The rich folk Jesus watched that day gave a lot, but compared to all they had, it wasn't really that much. And they did it for show. The poor widow woman gave everything. And for Jesus, that meant everything. See, giving is an appropriate and a natural response to the goodness of God. Giving to support the work of God's mission in and through the church, it blesses God, it blesses us, and it blesses this world. And God sees us, and he does care. Would you join me in giving today as an act of worship from the heart? Give with a desire to bless God, and through this ministry, God will use it to bless others, including us. You can give your offering today online, uh, through the mail, or by dropping it off at the building. There are other ways, too, that you can leverage your resources to benefit the church financially. And our church administrative assistant would love to talk with you about that sometime uh, if you get in touch with uh, her at the office. The poor widow was lauded because she didn't hold anything back from God. But she understood that everything she had was because of God. That too is why we give today. Because we know all that we have comes from God. Thank you for giving and supporting God's mission through this church. May God and our world be blessed because of it. Join me now in blessing our offering through our doxology and then we'll sing our closing song today. Let's sing. <laughs> God from blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above. 
Church, I hope that you had an encounter with the Almighty God today through worship and singing, through hearing his word, through prayer. I would encourage you to frame your life around encountering God, doing things that draw you closer to him so that you can know deeper the God who sees you. I want to thank everyone who brought in their Spartan Nash uh, receipts for the Direct Your Dollars program that's ending at the end of this month. Through your receipts and a donation of $138,000 worth of receipts this week from, some, from an organization, we easily met the goal of $150,000 in receipts and we're able to turn them in to receive a $1,000 donation for our church ministries. So thank you so much for helping us to meet that goal. Don't forget, we're collecting food for the Coopersville Cares Food Pantry all year long. And this first quarter of the year, we're specifically collecting pasta, sauce, canned pasta, and soups. You can bring those donations to the collection area at the church. Now, we've been focusing on this for the last four weeks. And last week, our mission team chair, Grace Holmes, took our first donations to the food pantry. 
145 items of food in just one month. That's fantastic. Imagine what we could do this whole year. So thank you for helping us to make sure our neighbors have access to the resources that they need. As we leave this place today, I'd invite you to receive today's benediction, this prayer of blessing as we depart from the closing verses of the book of Jude in the New Testament. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Be blessed, church. Have a wonderful week.